Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. We talk a lot about horror on this channel, but the real horror out there is how easy it is for your data to fall in the hands of disreputable people. That's why today's video is sponsored by Aura. While you're enjoying today's spooky video, data brokers, those things that go bump on the web, could already be selling your information to scanners, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, your health records, your relatives, they could all be out there. That's why I've been using Aura. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests just for me. It was simple to use and very intuitive, and I had barely gotten out of the setup process, and it was already blocking over 20 data broker requests on my behalf. Aura protects your passwords, your banking information, everything you need for day-to-day -day online life. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use my information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, other sensitive information, things like a certain YouTube channel that you all enjoy listening to so much. Aura also does much more to protect me and my family from online threats, the kind you can't see. It comes with other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It really is just that easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. I hear you saying, but Dr. Plague, I have one or two of these tools already. But, dear readers, not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Readers of my fine tales can tell you why that never ends well. Aura is always on, doing the hard work of keeping me safe so I can focus on other tasks like finishing my latest book or uploading my most recent video. I value my privacy, and I know you value yours. You can go to Aura.com, that's A-U-R-A dot com, to start your two-week free trial. You can also check out the link below and start your free trial with Aura. So why not give Aura a try and protect yourself from the real monsters out there? 4-20-2024 Hey, I'm Tatum Norlander. I'm an avid hiker, kayaker, climber, and overall outdoor enthusiast. I've been hiking consistently for three years now. I've been all throughout Idaho and uh, northwestern United States, and with this, I've had some strange encounters and incidents over the years I thought you might be interested in. Some of these... I personally experienced, whereas many others are hearsay or things I was told by other hikers or hiking groups. I can't back up the stories beyond my own. Belief is entirely your choice in this endeavor, and all I can do is hope that you choose to believe. But if you don't, well, I hope you enjoy some intriguing and terrifying tales nonetheless. My friend Jesse Ryder is a night owl. He's been a night owl for as long as I can remember, and although I never disapproved of it, it does make doing things with him rather annoying. He prefers to go hiking at night, and so despite being longtime friends, we don't spend that much time together. Regardless, this odd and rather unsafe habit has led to some weird stories, as of last year, we shared an apartment, and every morning... He'd arrive home for breakfast, only to tell me about his adventures from the night before. This was not one of these times, and in fact, this story, which he told me two weeks ago, was what initially inspired me to make this blog. Last night, I met up with him and recorded him telling me this story. Here's a transcript of that recording. Okay, recorder's on, so I need you to tell me exactly what happened. All right, uh, well, I guess I should start at the start. As, well, most nights I was out driving. I've always loved just driving out in the woods. It's always been really comforting to me. Something about having the quiet, dark woods all to myself, but unlike most nights, I wasn't alone. I was with Brandon. I talked him into driving down the bridge with me. 
can you talk about the bridge? Yeah, yeah, I can. So the bridge is an old trestle bridge that goes over Snake River. Till a couple of years ago, it was still in operation, but for whatever reason, they condemned it. I presume you don't know why then. Yeah, nobody has a clue. Bridge is still as sturdy and stable as ever, which is why me and Brandon went down there. It's a fun place where you can hang out and be loud while knowing we won't be bothered. Okay, tell me more about the night of your encounter. So like me and Brandon parked the truck on the nearby logging road and made the short hike through the dark woods towards the bridge. Sometimes it can get pretty nerve-wracking walking on that bridge. It's not very wide, and worse still, it doesn't have any handrails to speak of. You gotta walk along it and hope you don't lose your balance. But I think I kind of like that about it. There's this thrill to it, like I know I'm doing something that most people wouldn't do. Where was I? All right, the, the bridge. That night, me and Brandon brought a six-pack of beer. In hindsight, a pretty dumb move, and a shotgun. We had this game we would do. When one of us would finish a beer, we'd grab the shotgun and toss the empty can off the bridge. The goal was always to shoot the can before it fell out of range. Well, that night, Brandon finished his beer first, so reluctantly, I handed him the shotgun and got ready to throw his can. I'd like to emphasize something here really quick. Up to this point, the night, the night was normal. We could hear the owls and the trees and the chirping of the crickets and the rushing of the river, but that quickly changed. Hey, can we, can we get a break, break for a minute? So yeah, I, uh, I threw the can up in an arc. Brandon aimed just below where it was. Time seemed to slow down as I watched the can fly through the air. The moonlight reflected so brightly off of it, I had to I had to look away for a minute. Bang! Can exploded and rocketed off down towards the ground. For a moment, we were both grinning and laughing, happy the first shot had made it. Then a new sound filled my still ringing ears. I just there's nothing like it. Never heard anything like that horrible caw sound. I don't. I don't, I don't even know how to describe it. Give it a try, man. For two long weeks, I've been researching all sorts of animal calls, but it wasn't any of them. There were familiar-sounding calls, but not one like this one. I'll try my best to explain the sound, whatever you want to call it. The call kind of had a flow of laughter, but you could tell it wasn't laughing, like a... Like a hyena, you know? The call was comprised of multiple cacophonies of laughter with deep grumbling sounds in between them. <sighs> the laughing high notes of the call were so long. For my research, most calls don't last longer than about 10 seconds, but, but this one, this one had to have lasted a few minutes. Each high note was almost the duration of a normal animal call. I've researched a lot of animal calls. Oddly, the closest thing I've found is a kookaburra, howler monkey, certain great apes, and, and tigers. I don't mean to say the call sounded like all of them at once, but more different elements of the call sounded like each animal. The kookaburra has a similar pitch, and sounds of high notes. The howler monkeys have similar durations of sound. The, the great apes and the tiger have a have a similar growl at the low note. Now, I know how long I just took to describe that, but that call only lasted a minute, and the whole time me and Brandon just stood there, too horrified to move. As soon as that call ended, we just started running. The call had come from off to the side of the bridge that we had to go to, although from the way it echoed, you could tell it was a lot closer to the river. Me and Brandon were going as fast as we could while still trying to be careful. Brandon, who arguably was more terrified than me, had loaded the shotgun just in case. So we made our way closer to the edge of the bridge, 
started to hear things. The rustling of leaves, the snapping of branches. I knew then that whatever was down there was making its way to us. I said screw it and safety went right out the window. I started sprinting the rest of the bridge. Brandon stayed at my heels, breathing heavy and shaking like a leaf. Once we made our way to the solid ground, we just we just started flying down the trail. We were both terrified something was chasing us, and in the distance, I could hear something large moving through the forest. As we ran, it seemed to gain on us. I kept turning around, but every time I was greeted by nothing but the dark forest. <sighs> We can take a break if you need to. Yeah. Yeah, I might, I might need a minute. After a few minutes, Jesse said he could continue. I... I tripped. The last time I went to turn around, I, I lost my foot and then I tripped. I face-planted onto the ground, scraping my arms and face pretty bad. Before... Before I could even pull myself up, Brandon was practically dragging me by the collar of my shirt. That... That damn... Whatever it was. It was getting even closer. We sprinted onward for our lives. I was holding the truck keys in front of me, slamming the hazard button, just hoping that it might save us. It was just when I was starting to think that this thing might catch us, that the wonderful sound of the truck horn burst through the quiet night. The sounds of the thing stopped, but we kept running. We didn't stop until the truck doors were locked behind us. We sat there, in the truck, wheezing and trying to get the air in our lungs that we'd lost. At last, I flicked on the truck lights and the rugged forest road ahead of us was illuminated. But, but I noticed something else. It, it must have been at least 20 feet in the trees. There were... Two eyes cast in red from the headlights. <sighs> I hadn't been back to the forest since. Jesse's story is not the only one I have. Far from it. In the spirit of good nature, I will share three more that I think you'll all find quite interesting. Hopefully if you do, I'll follow up with another post with more stories. The next story, or rather topic, I would like to address is, well, bunkers. Since I was little, I've heard stories of these supposedly deep, deep in the woods, or massive underground bunkers. Nobody knows why they're there, or what their purpose is. In fact, most people have never actually seen one. But stories have been around long enough that I thought I would bring them up. To be perfectly honest, I'm bringing these up to see if any of you have heard of one, or maybe even seen one. Closest thing I have to one is a strange story that an acquaintance told me. He told me a story that his grandfather had told him, and that this had happened to his grandfather in the early 50s. His granddad, a man named John, had served in World War II, and after the war, had become sort of a hermit. He'd been traumatized by the war to such a degree that when he came home, he became a hermit. So much so that he moved to the mountains to live in the woods by himself, away from the people that reminded him of his mental burden. It was after five years of that that he found it. John was patrolling through the woods looking for some mushrooms to add to his stew. He'd just crested a large hill and was descending the slope of the hill and into a gully. Within the gully was a decent-sized flowing stream. Curious, as the gully was new to him, John quickly descended the hill and into the gully. As he walked through the gully, he noticed something up ahead. There was something built on a large rocky outcrop near the wall. It must have been 15 feet above where he stood, so he could only vaguely make out something on top of it. He called out when he saw a thin line of smoke ascending from the outcrop, but no one responded. He quickly ascended the outcrop to a strange and horrifying sight. A desk sat atop the outcropping. It was an ornate, well-crafted desk, comprised of wood. The wood was polished with an exquisite detail carved into it. It looked like it would have been in an office room of some rich man. Next to the desk was an equally exquisite chair that lay on its side. 
and atop the desk sat a typewriter and a banker's lamp, a ballpoint pen, and a few scattered pieces of paper. What really horrified him, though, was the lamp. The lamp was on. He walked closer, only to see on the paper were normal banker's reports. He was so horrified by the sight, he hurried and left without another look, and he refused to ever go back. In fact, it was the last straw that pushed him back into society, where he later got married and had my acquaintance's father. Another story comes from a distant friend of mine named Aaron Briggs. He told me this by campfire when we were talking about experiences we'd had when we were kayaking. This was about the same time I'd started thinking about maybe making this blog, so, like my conversation with Jess, I recorded it and wrote a transcript for the post. So you know Tate. Something real weird happened the last time I went out kayaking with him. What's that? Well, I saw something weird in the water. It was like a, like a big something go on. Ah, well, I was kayaking along the shore of Michigan, Lake Michigan, that is, with a couple of other guys. It was pretty normal. We were having a lot of fun, and Isaac kept picking up mud with his paddle and swinging it back at us like the moron that he is. Well, I'd just reached the section near the thick patch of reeds, and I was trying to steer away from it, not wanting to get caught up in them. That's when it happened in a snap. The water near the edge of the reeds burst with a horrendous explosion of sound as something beneath it dived towards my kayak. I hardly had time to react, only able to turn my head to see how large the disturbance in the water was. Things smashed into the side of my kayak, flipping it over and flipping me out. Next thing I knew, I was swimming up to the surface, watching a massive dark shape disappear into the foggy water. What the hell? That was what I thought. You think it was a jumping sturgeon? Maybe, but the thing looked too broad, and it would have to be a massive sturgeon. Catfish, maybe? From its silhouette in the water, it was broad in the middle and narrow on each end. Catfish, catfish aren't built like that. It's pretty weird, man. Pretty weird indeed. We both tried brainstorming a few more ideas on what it could have been, but we didn't reach a verdict, and honestly, if any of you know your fish and can tell us what that probably was, feel free to share. Last thing I want to talk about is, I wasn't sure if I should bring it up, but my friend said you guys would probably find it interesting. These, like most of the strange things, aren't very common, but more common than you might expect. All the time, when we're out in the woods, we'll stumble across dead animals. And I know that isn't really disturbing, but trust me, these are. I've seen a few weird ones, and they were pretty ghastly. One time in Glacier National Park, I found a mountain goat lying on the side of the road. Its neck was broken so severely the head was barely hanging on. That in itself was traumatic, but... I almost puked when I saw the maggots and flies all inside of its mouth and eyes. An especially adventurous worm was slithering out of one nostril. Me and Marcus, the guy I was with, ended up moving it a hundred or so feet into the woods. We didn't want anyone else to see it. Another one was actually a pair of corpses. They were two bull elks. I'd found them while out hunting, lying on a riverbank. Blood was everywhere, and they'd sustained horrible injuries in an attempt to separate from one another. Their corpses were bony husks, which led me to the sad realization that they'd probably starve to death. It was only after looking long enough that I came to the realization that one of the bulls was still alive, but it was knocking on death's door. Out of mercy, I aimed the barrel into its forehead and fired. It died instantly. That one was pretty rough, and from time to time, I still find myself thinking about it. The worst one I ever found, though, was a wolf. That one scared me for different reasons than the others. With the others, they were tragic incidents of nature, but this one, God, this one, couldn't be explained. For context, me and Marcus and Aaron and another friend named Tanner took a high school graduation trip to Alaska. Our group was to go ice fishing, snowmobiling, and hunting. 
It was while snowmobiling through miles of snow-covered forest that we found it. The quickly setting Alaskan sun cast a red glow off the blood-drenched snow. The light made the steam coming from it glow like thick clouds of gas, so much so that it blinded us and we had to stop. With a closer look, we could see the horribly mutilated wolf that the steam was coming from. Blood was all over the snow with flecks of muscle tissue, bones, and long snaky cords of intestine. The, the cords led from the upper body of the wolf. In life, it must have been beautiful, large, and impressive, but now it was nothing more than a mutilated body. The upper body was broken and beaten. The ribs were caved in and shattered to splinters. The skull was split open, exposing the brain. The jaws looked like they'd been forced open to their limit before cracking under the pressure. The organs spilled out of every hole in its body. We all threw up. Marcus started sobbing, and Aaron looked on the verge of a panic attack. I had to step away, still puking, and had to lean against a tree. I was hurling, screaming, and crying. This was nothing like I'd ever seen, and, and it was horrible. It was only then that I felt it, a steady dripping of warm liquid on the top of my head. I stepped away from the tree before looking up into the branches. The lower half of the wolf dangled in one of those branches, so broken that if it weren't for the upper counterpoint, I would never have recognized it. We all, we all hurried out of there, completely traumatized. I think I'll end this post here. If you have any interest in the subject, I will continue this blog with a second post. Please comment, question, or anything of that nature. I promise to read as many as I can. Also, if you have any similar stories, please feel free to share in the comments, or message me if you would like it to be a potential for the next post. Thanks for your time. Tatum, over and out. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to Osnap, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tomboy Top Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our ghostly writer tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon, or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton Tier Contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early, at 8.30 a.m., as opposed to 8.30 p.m., my time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book, anytime I write one, on your doorstep, in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.